In the last video, I talked about how Bitcoin transactions are really incorporated into a, a global and a publicly accessible ledger of sorts that we call the transaction blockchain. And, and this work is actually carried out by nodes in the Bitcoin network that are known as Bitcoin miners. And as a reward for all that effort, especially since some of the uh, uh, computational heavy lifting is done by these Bitcoin miners, they're basically awarded a certain number of Bitcoins for their efforts. And this happens by the miners effectively constructing what's called a coin-based transaction and then basically assigning themselves Bitcoins within that transaction. So in a sense then, and this is kind of intriguing, Bitcoins are effectively generated almost out of thin air during this process. And of course, if you see something like that, that might raise in your mind the question of whether uh, there is ever an upper limit to the, the Bitcoin money supply. And fortunately, the answer, or, or maybe not so fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, the answer to that question is actually yes. And the Bitcoin system is actually designed so that there can be at most, at most 21 million Bitcoins ever generated. Okay, so uh, that's the, the maximum number of Bitcoins ever that can ever come up in the system. Uh, beyond that point, no more new Bitcoins will ever be accepted or generated or allowed to be generated. And so as a result, nodes at that point or from that point onward, once 21 million Bitcoins have been generated, nodes will no longer get a reward for augmenting the transaction blockchain. Okay, these Bitcoin miners who do all this effort are not going to get uh, a guaranteed award for doing that effort. And keep in mind that because every transaction in the Bitcoin system is public, and the nodes in the system actually know how many coins have been generated, it's possible to really enforce these limits on the total number of Bitcoins created. Now, there are actually two points I want to make regarding this particular limit. So first of all, even after it's reached, uh, you know, we're still going to need nodes to do what Bitcoin mining nodes do today. So that involves things like incorporating transactions into transaction blocks and incorporating these transaction blocks into transaction blockchains and so on and so forth. But if you think about it for a moment, once the 21 million coin limit is reached, these nodes don't get that automatic reward of Bitcoins for performing this extra effort. And now you might be wondering, well, what incentive is there for these nodes to engage in this additional effort? I mean, why are they doing this sort of thing if they're not going to get Bitcoins as a guarantee for, for doing that work? And really at this point, um, the hope is that uh, when we reach the 21 million Bitcoin limit, or as we get closer and closer to it, that actually transaction fees will play a more prominent role in a node's decision to be a Bitcoin uh, mining node. And in, in particular, the, the idea here is that we hope the transaction fees will be enough of an incentive. And more and more people will, in general, I think hopefully by this point, will be using Bitcoin. And so as a result, um, I think there is an expectation or it's not unreasonable to think that as more and more people use bitcoins there will be more and more transactions and as a result more and more opportunity to make money off of transaction fees and it turns out that in the context of bitcoin mining a lot of the heavy lifting is in this proof of work piece not in being able to incorporate all these transactions into a transaction block so even if there's a lot of transactions in the transaction block it's not that much more effort for the the miners to really incorporate those extra transactions. But if they're, getting, if they're getting all these extra transaction fees, then that might be a good incentive for them, okay? It's also worth noting that transaction fees are actually set by the payer in Bitcoin, okay? The payer then is gonna have the onus of setting the fee appropriately so that the nodes in the Bitcoin network are incentivized to add that payer's transactions to their transaction blocks. All right, so hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, the second point I wanna make regarding this, this limit of 21 million Bitcoins is that really Bitcoin does allow for fractional coins. And I haven't really talked much about that in this video series. I've really kind of implicitly talked only about the idea of coins being these whole entities like Alice transferring 10 coins to Bob or 25 coins to Bob and, and so on. But it turns out you can actually have coins that are fractional, okay? And in fact, the smallest possible unit in Bitcoin, it's a very small number, it's 0 0.0000001 Bitcoins, okay? And this is one 100 millionth of a Bitcoin. And this actual use, this unit, by the way, just um, as an FYI, is, is known as a Satoshi, 
And this name actually comes from the name Satoshi Nakamoto. And Satoshi Nakamoto is the, the pseudonym of the inventor of Bitcoin. Nobody actually is, is sure that there is somebody actually named Satoshi Nakamoto, but as far as anybody can tell, the only person who's ever taken credit for the invention of Bitcoin is this, this Satoshi Nakamoto name. And, and it's unlikely there's not actually a person behind that name, but it's more likely maybe some type of a group or, or something of that nature. Okay. Now, aside from that, there are actually a couple of other additional controls that I want to mention uh, that are built into Bitcoin for keeping the growth of that money supply in check. Uh, so first of all, the reward provided to Bitcoin miners actually decreases over time. Okay. And if you, if you were aware when, when Bitcoin began, which was around, uh, uh, January of 2009, at that time, the reward for a Bitcoin miner, uh, to do their effort was 50 Bitcoins. Okay. Now the way that the reward structure is set up is that every 210,000 blocks. So when you get to a 210,000 block period, every time 210,000 new blocks are generated, the reward size actually gets cut uh, in half. Okay. And so what that means is that um, once 210,000 blocks are generated, the reward goes from 50 bitcoins to 25 bitcoins and from 25 to 12 and a half and, and so on and so forth. All right. Now it does take approximately, approximately four years uh, to generate 210,000 blocks. And I'll talk a little bit later about where this four years numbers come from. But as of right now, um, I'm recording this video. It's May 2013. The current reward is actually no longer 50 Bitcoins. The current reward now is is actually 25 uh, Bitcoins per, per mining operation. And it's going to go down in half in approximately four years. And, and it, that's just going to keep happening until the estimate is around the year, around the year, 2140 so in the year 2140 we're we will expect that the entire um bitcoin supply will have been generated okay so we're not gonna it's unlikely we'll be generating bitcoins after 2140 uh 2140 is the point at which all bitcoins all bitcoins will have been generated okay all bitcoins will have been generated now the last way to limit the generation of bitcoins is to actually calibrate the difficulty of solving that proof of work protocol at a global level. Okay. And so I also want to point out that another functionality that Bitcoin has built into it is that, um, for every 2016 blocks that are generated, the network basically estimates the time that it took to generate those blocks. It looks at, you know, how long did it take to generate the first of these blocks and how long did it take to generate the last of these blocks and it measures, uh, that amount of time. Now, if that amount of time is, uh, let's say it's, it's um, I don't know, let's say it's, it's something that's significantly, um, let's say it's significantly uh, bigger than two weeks. Okay. So if it's significantly bigger than two weeks, then the proof of work protocol will be simplified. Okay. We're going to calibrate it so that it's easier to generate blocks. On the flip side, let's say it took a lot less than two weeks to generate these 2016 blocks. In that case, the proof of work will be again calibrated to be made more difficult. Okay. And the goal is that we want it to be the case that of 2016 blocks, we want it to be the case that it takes about two weeks to generate these blocks, about 14 days to generate 2016 blocks. Okay. And to get a better sense for why that number is the way it is, you, you can see that let's say, uh, let's say it takes about uh, two weeks to generate uh, 2016 blocks. Uh, what that actually will imply is that it takes about 10 minutes before the proof of work is actually solved and a new transaction is, uh, or a new transaction block rather, is folded into the overall transaction blockchain. And you can actually work out that if you, if you, if it took 10 minutes to, to validate or to come up with one new block in the system at, at a global level, and you multiply that by, by obviously, uh, by six to get the number of blocks generated per hour. So you get six blocks per hour, or really six new proofs of work per hour, which in turn would lead to six new transaction blocks per hour. You multiply that by 24 um, hours per day, and then you multiply that by 14 days, and you'll actually find that when you, when you multiply these things together, you will get the number 2016, okay? And so you can, you can get a sense of where this number comes from. 
And I want to make one last and final clarifying remark regarding this, this proof of work. Um, since solving the proof of work actually requires a Bitcoin mining node to come up with the proof string, which it currently does through some type of exhaustive search, as you increase the number of Bitcoin mining nodes on the network, then really all else being equal, the proof of work will be solved faster. Okay, and when I, I don't mean faster for a particular node, I mean faster at the level of the entire network. In other words, um, it'll take less time before at least one node comes up with the solution because these nodes are all working on that same problem concurrently. And actually on, on that note, I do also want to mention quickly, uh, maybe a more subtle point, which is that even though the different Bitcoin mining nodes are all validating either the exact same uh, set of transactions or maybe a largely overlapping set of transactions, they actually are all solving uh, entirely different proof of work protocols when they're doing this sort of thing. And the reason for that is that each node, remember, inserts its own Coinbase or generational transaction into the block that it's working on to award itself coins. Okay, and this generational or coin-based transaction is actually unique to each node. So as a result, the challenge string for which, let's say, each Bitcoin mining node is, is seeking a corresponding proof of work, well, that challenge string will be different for each Bitcoin, no, or each Bitcoin mining node, rather. And so essentially, what you have is that because you have a cryptographic hash function that's being used in the process, just this one difference, the, the fact that just this one piece is different, that actually completely randomizes the proof of work problem that results. And that makes it likely that across the entire network, the solutions are likely to be widely distributed. And we can expect that if we have enough nodes, one node will come up with a solution uh, in about 10 minutes. Okay, at least one of the nodes will. They won't all do it, but at least one will. And once one node comes up with a solution, everyone else can kind of proceed from that point onward with the new chain. So as you can see, the Bitcoin protocol, you know, takes a number of measures, it implements a number of, of mechanisms to both limit the total number of Bitcoins as well as the rate at which these Bitcoins are ultimately generated.